Well, anyway, thanks for coming. Um, it was uh, four years ago, four and a little bit of years ago, when I went to the very first Docker meetup in uh, White Pages, actually. Was there anybody, anybody here who was in that meetup? One, two, nice. Do you remember that I was in that meetup? <laughs> I, don't, I probably not. Um, uh, and I came down from White Pages that night, and I, uh, you know, I, we were thinking a lot about this, Joe and Craig and I were thinking a lot about this, and the whole thing just sort of crystallized, and we built some prototypes, and amazing stuff happened after that, um, and lots and lots and lots of other people came and joined and helped. Um, and so it's been an amazing journey to, to go from there to here, um, so I'm very grateful for you to come here. I think this is the... This is the only the second time that I've spoken at the Docker meetup, or I didn't even really speak at the other Docker meetup. But um, so it's cool to be back. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about serverless containers and their interactions with Kubernetes. Um, do some demos, hopefully they'll work, and uh, we'll go from there. All right. So serverless containers. Um, I talk about serverless containers these days from time to time, um, and I get a lot of sort of blank looks. Um, and I think that's because. In many respects, as an industry, we've sort of conflated the notion of serverless with the notion of functions as a service. Um, and I think it's really important to distinguish between the two um, and, and talk about what I mean when I say serverless containers. Because I think it's important not just that we have words that have meaning um, and, and that we agree on what they mean, but also I think it's important as we look forward to how the industry is shaping itself up for the next five, ten years, that we're thinking about the various axes on which we can build technology. So for functions as a service, um, you know, one of the primary benefits, of course, is there's no operating system, there's no machine. Um, but in addition to those sort of like components, and I think that's shared with serverless, it has this, this model that is pay per request, right? Every single request you get, you pay a little bit. Um, and this event-driven programming model, right, which is a very opinionated stack uh, around how you build your applications as well as generally a limited choice of programming languages. Um, and, and that's sort of the way functions as a service delivers this, this really easy to use um, developer paradigm, right? It's extremely easy to go from code to the cloud. I think when we start thinking about serverless infrastructure, and, and I think the serverless container work that I'm gonna talk about is serverless infrastructure, which is differentiated from that sort of event-driven model. You still have no operating system and you still have no machine to think about. Um, and that again comes back to the serverless, I just wanna run my code somewhere. Um, I just want to make it work, and I don't want to think about upgrades, and I don't want to think about machine failures, and I don't want to think about even necessarily process failures. Um, I just want it to keep going, no matter what. Um, but with serverless infrastructure, instead of doing pay per request, you're paying per resource usage. Right? So you're paying for core memory per second, or core memory per hour, much more akin to like the way you pay for a VM than the way you traditionally would pay for a platform as a service. Um, but in, in contrast to VMs, because it's containerized, the spin-up times are measured in seconds or less, um, so, you know, single-digit seconds, um, and as well as the fact that there really isn't an opinion in it, there is an opinion here around what you run. Anything you can take and package up in a container instance or in a container image, you can run inside of a serverless container. And I think this is really important because it's it, it is definitely a little bit harder. Right? You have to learn about Docker, you have to containerize your application, you have to think about things like that, but you also get a ton of freedom out of it. You can do background processing, you can do batch processing, you can run things for longer than 10 minutes, you can use more memory than you know, two gigabytes or whatever that are the confines that a functions as a service environment might give you or some other platform as a service might give you. But you still have all the flexibility and freedom that comes from not worrying about operating systems and not worrying about machines. Um, and I, I think one of the really nice things here is that if you have a relatively simple application, once you forget about machine failures and once you forget about task restarts, um, you can deliver something pretty reliable in, in a singleton, right? I think we like, like to talk a lot about microservices and fancy architectures, and, but I think we shouldn't underestimate the value of, of a, a single application running in a reliable way. All right, so with Azure Container Instances, um, we provide this sort of serverless uh, the serverless infrastructure, and this is basically what it takes to get your container up and running uh, on the public internet, right? Um, and I and I think it's it's it pretty it shows you I think the power of the serverless infrastructure that you know one command and your container is up and running. And we'll see a little bit of a demo of that later. Um, but to give you a sense for what it looks like, the Azure Container Instances group container groups and serverless container infrastructure is really been based on pods, right? So it's been it it really is. Um, trying to give you, uh, effectively, the pods as a service. 
Um, they're, con they're called container groups because you can group multiple containers together. I think that, you know, um, in all honesty, when I originally did the prototype of Kubernetes, um, there weren't pods in there. And I think Joe is the one who told me I had to do it. Um, so credit to him wherever he is. Uh, you know, he, he, we, we refactored it in relatively, if I remember correctly, relatively late in the pre, sort of some of the pre-prod work. Um, and uh, so anyway, it, it's, it's turned out to be a very valuable pattern for a lot of things. Um, and just like with pods, we have shared network, public IPs. Optionally, you don't have to have a public IP in a shared file system. Um, as well as some features like disk mounting, secrets mounting, automatic restart, or run to completion, right? If you're gonna run a batch job, automatic restart is actually a bad thing. Um, streaming logs, and a bunch of other sort of things to make it really a relatively tight, easy to use developer experience. Um, so to give you a sense for, for what that looks like, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do a brief interlude. Uh, First, the computer science quiz is, it's, it's a little bit obvious because the picture's big, but anybody know what this is? It's DAC equipment. Sorry? It's DAC It's DAC equipment. It's a PDP-11. Uh, anybody actually used one? Yeah. Nice. nice. All right. I have actually not, I've used an Altair, one of the little switchy Altair things, but I've never used a PDP-11, much to my chagrin. Um, by the way, side note, they didn't pay me, but if you haven't been down to the Living Computer Museum, which is just right down the street, oh, totally. you should totally go check it out. Absolutely, totally cool. Um, and great for kids, too, actually. I, I love taking my family there. So that's one of the other things. Um, but not just to endorse them, I had this startup idea. Um, and uh, so if people, I hope nobody's going to steal it from me, but I'm going to tell you all about it. We live here in Cloud City. And so my idea is we're going to take the PDP-11 to the cloud. Right? I'm sick of this x86 architecture. I'm sick of, I'm sick of like, powerful computers. We're going to take the PDP-11 <laughs> to the cloud. Um, and so, and I'm going to just, we're going to package up mail. You thought that Windows, you know, Windows 98 was legacy. Wait till you see PDP-11s. Um, this is like, like, actually, interestingly enough, they just shut down. I just saw, so, no, they didn't shut down. I saw some article when I was reading about this. I saw some article where the nuclear power plants were like, we're probably going to keep running our PDP-11s to like 2050. Um, maybe they should run in the cloud. But anyway, the question is, like, how would you do this? All right? How are we going to take our PDP-11 up into the cloud? Um, and it turns out that the easiest way to do this is containers, obviously, uh, and uh, Azure Container Instances, uh, or serverless containers in general. Um, and so, you know, we're going to take our server, we're going to take our PDP-11, our startup is going to profit on top, of, uh, on top of this serverless container infrastructure. So let's take a look at a demo of that. Um, go over here. Drop into my friendly terminal. All right, so I have this image here that I created. It's out there on Docker Hub. Um, that runs a PDP-11. It runs a full-on PDP-11 emulator. Launches uh, BSD, what is it, 1.1, I think it's whatever. It's like the, the latest, greatest, most awesome as BSD you could have in 1990. Um, that, uh, yeah. um, and it's containerized. Um, and I'm going to tell it I want a public IP address. Um, I give it this environment variable that the container requires to just basically says like, yes, I understand my machine image is going into a container and it's going to get destroyed the minute the container dies. Basically, it wants you to act that. I'm going to tell it that I want it to serve on port 8080 um, and we're going to go run that. All right. So it's going out over the internet. This is the part where I pray to the, you know, the demigods. It's already the blue screen. Yeah. Um, do we have any good jokes? I should have gone through the whole startup spiel while it was creating, I guess. Um, I have some members of the, the, the Azure Container Instances. Oh, there we go. Fantastic. All right. Just in time. You were saved, Chen. I was going to pull you up here to explain what was going wrong. Um, all right. Uh, so here we go. I have my container group that's been created. Um, and it's got uh, something running on port 8080. It's got one CPU. It's got 1.5 gigabytes of memory. Um, it's in the process of creating. It's serving on port 8080, and it's given me a public IP address. So we'll copy that public IP address. Um, go over to my friendly web browser. We'll hope like heck that it's fully up. That's fine. And we will again wait. Well, eventually the interwebs do their thing. I should have had more rookie mistakes happening all over the place here. I should have had more stall material. Um, I 
I get critical status. We could do, oh, there we go. See? Did it. Um, all right, so I have inside of my container, I actually have a container group. Um, I have one container that's actually running the PDP 11 emulator, which opens a Telnet port uh, for you to connect into this emulator. Anybody remember what Telnet is? I actually had somebody ask me the other day. No, that was a while ago. I won't tell you who it is, but he was like, What's Telnet? I was like, you just tell that to the web server and like type it, HD, you know, HTTP in and let's see what happens. And he's like, let's tell that. Like, it wasn't Joe, was it? It was not Joe. No, it was not Joe. Um, and I said, well, it's like insecure SSH. Um, it's like Netcat only, only with a better user. It's Netcat with a better user interface. Um, but uh, so anyway, so we're telling that. So I have one container that's running my emulator. I have one container that's running this web interface, uh, Xterm JS. Thank you very much to the Xterm JS folks. Um, and now I can log in, uh, and there I am inside my PDP 11 running BSD. Um, no tab completion, no bash. Bash, it turns out, 1993, I'm like lost, I'm lost here. But we can do an ls um, and you know cd into slash let's see, let's see what's going on. Anyway, point is, very short period of time. PDP emulator with the front end running in this container group up on Azure Container Instances. So that gives you an idea, I think, of how quickly you can go from something that you've developed locally. Um, in fact, it took me way longer to get all this stuff wired up than, than to actually run it. Um, jumping back into the talk. Obviously, though, if I'm going to take this to the cloud, if I'm going to take this to the cloud, I, need to, I can't just run one PDP emulator, right? I need a lot of PDP emulators. I'm going to do like PDP 11 as a service. Um, and so we're going to just we're going we're to go big. Uh, and so you know, initially when you think about doing this, you might think, well, great, you created this one Azure Container Instances. Okay, now just add account. You know, add account to Azure Container Instances, and you've got 20 of the Ray that Um And I think it's really important. One of the principles behind Kubernetes from the get-go was this notion that we're building modular, reusable componentry. And honestly, having built one orchestrator, I don't want to build another one. And I don't think I should build another one. And I think it's really great that we're seeing the consolidation around one interface because it allows us to think about where we go from here and how do we build tools on top. And it allows us to really, I mean, I saw someone, <clears throat> excuse me, I saw someone saying earlier today, I think it was on Twitter, that he hopes in 10 years we'll have forgotten about Kubernetes. And I strongly believe that is, is the goal, right? This should be like thinking about x86 at the end of the day. And I hope that we're there. And so as a result of that, Having built this serverless container infrastructure, I don't want to go build orchestration that is new and different and you know has, you have to learn it. I want to take you with something that's familiar, that has all the tooling that you would expect. And so the question is, how do we get to a world where I can use the Kubernetes API to run serverless containers? And in fact, how can I produce serverless Kubernetes? Um, and because that's really what I want. I mean, I don't. I want my my cloud infrastructure running these PDP 11s. I want them to be secure. I don't want you to be able to break out of your PDP 11 and get into somebody else's PDP 11. Um, but I don't want to think about machines, right? Like the dirty secret behind the Kubernetes API is it gives you these fantastic abstractions. But at the end of the day, there's a bunch of machines underneath it, and you kind of have to think about them. And services take care of it for you to a degree, but they're still there, and you're still paying for them. I mean, like the drop charge for a working Kubernetes cluster in the cloud is order a hundred dollars. Right, hundred dollars a month. That's pretty crappy, right? If I only want to run, a, you know, if my startup idea doesn't doesn't pan out, and I only run a few PDP 11s. Like, I don't want to pay hundred dollars a month. Um, so, how do we get rid of those machines? Um, and and that's where I think what we what what I would propose is, you know, we're going to start seeing serverless containers coming in as the substrate on which the orchestrator has been built. Um, but not entirely, I don't think. I think actually this is more like the way that the world looks, right? Where if I have dedicated load, if I have enough activity to keep six machines happy or loaded up, I'm going to buy six machines, right? Because I can keep them at 80% efficiency or 80% utilization, and I'm pretty happy with that. But I'm still going to have container instances for burst, for build, for batch, for everything that I need to do that's lightweight and additional on top. Furthermore, you know, some things are harder, like we don't have GPU in, in Azure Container Instances. Maybe we will someday, but we don't right now. So if you need to do machine learning, you need to give us a machine in order to do machine learning. So how do we do this? Well, we've developed this thing called the Virtual Kubelet. Um, and basically, what the Virtual Kubelet does is it acts as a bridge between the Kubernetes API server and serverless container infrastructure. Um, so the Virtual Kubelet runs as a process. It registers a virtual node with the API server. So suddenly, Kubernetes discovers that it has a new node. Um, it's not a real node. There's no machine that's associated with it. But it 
looks to Kubernetes like it's a node that it can schedule things onto. Um, it heartbeats for that virtual node because Kubernetes has some expectations around the API that it'll heartbeat its status back into the, the API server. So it does everything that's needed basically to more or less trick Kubernetes into thinking that there's this virtual node out there. Um, then if you want to do something, you can use the Kubernetes API to create a deployment. A deployment then is replicated and you're going to say, well, I want to have six instances of a container up and running. Um, the scheduler, the standard, bog standard, no changes Kubernetes scheduler will then schedule no, uh, containers to that virtual kubelet node. Um, and then the virtual kubelet will notice that those things have been scheduled to it and it will go into this conta serverless container API and actually go and spin up the containers. And so now we can actually use Kubernetes primitives to drive this serverless container infrastructure. Um, and likewise, the virtual kubelet is going to heartbeat the status from that container back into the Kubernetes API. So if I want to get the status of a container, um, if I want to do things like get the logs for a container, I can use the, the standard Kubernetes interfaces, and, and more importantly than me using the standard Kubernetes interfaces, all of the tools that people built around those Kubernetes interfaces work too. Right? And so there's a lot of value not just in presenting a common interface and not reinventing the wheel, but actually enabling all of the ecosystem of tools that people have built on top of these APIs to not have to care effectively whether the containers you're running are running on traditional machines or, or, or serverless infrastructure. Um, and that just shows you sort of how logs work as well. Um, now you, you say, well, okay, that's great. but like. What does it actually look like when you run? Well, we assume that you have a Kubernetes cluster. You at least have an API server up and running. Um, either you did it yourself or you used cloud provided one. Um, you can create the virtual kubelet container that will run on top of that Kubernetes cluster. The virtual kubelet container will then talk back to the Kubernetes API, register that virtual node, and suddenly you're in this hybrid world where you have a Kubernetes cluster that has both physical machines and Azure container instances. And all of that communication that you saw before is going to be happening uh, back and forth um, to enable Kubernetes to take advantage of this virtual node. All right. Um, and in fact, actually, we don't expect there to be one virtual node. Um, already, when you use the virtual, uh, the virtual kubelet, Azure container instances has both serverless containers for Windows containers and serverless containers for Linux containers. So it actually it, it can register two different nodes, one for the Linux version, one for the Windows version, and you can actually you know, send different containers to different places, just as you can if you had Windows or Linux machines connected to the, to the Kubernetes APIs. Um, so the virtual kubelet is open source. It's up on GitHub at virtual kubelet, virtual kubelet. Um, we're not the only people to be thinking about serverless containers. Um, there was a, a, there's a startup called Hyper, hyper.sh, that's been working on this. Uh, AWS, about six months after we, we did Azure uh, Container Instances, announced a service called Fargate. Um, and we're all working together to figure out what it means to bring serverless container infrastructure to Kubernetes. Um, as well as working with the SigNode folks in upstream Kubernetes, because there's a lot of really interesting open questions. For example, right now, external service load balancers and virtual kubelet don't work pre 1.9, right? And the reason that this doesn't work is because the load balancer tries to register the virtual, if you create a cloud load balancer, it tries to register this virtual kubelet node with the load balancer. Like, clearly that doesn't work, right? Because the virtual node doesn't exist. The load balancer can't generate any traffic to it. Um, so we had to go in and teach Kubernetes to say, hey, here's an annotation, and if this node has this annotation, don't put it into the load balancer. There's a lot more of these kinds of this kind of work that we need to do as we sort of walk down the path of figuring out what it means to run an orchestration API that, that may not even have any machines. Um, and then there's a lot of really interesting, deeper questions about how scheduling interacts, right? So Kubernetes believes that a node is a unit of failure. But this virtual serverless infrastructure, serverless container infrastructure, it's not a unit of failure, right? There's lots of different machines, and in fact, if one of the machines in the serverless infrastructure fails, the container will move somewhere else. So Kubernetes is sort of biased to not wanting to put, lots of, not wanting to put multiple containers onto one node for reasons of reliability. But in this case, it actually needs to understand, well, that's actually kind of this weird node that, that can't fail. So it's actually OK to put multiple containers onto that node because they won't fail. Right? And there's a lot of these sorts of discussions about, and of course, the serverless container infrastructure has its own scheduler. Okay? And it has its own notions of affinity and all of this stuff. So like, there's a lot of interesting questions to figure out around how much do we defer to the Kubernetes scheduler, how much do we defer to the serverless container scheduler, and how do we balance those two things together. Um, and, and many things more. As the last thing, uh, I want to give you a demo of how this looks. Um, 
we'll go back out here. <coughs> All right, and uh, I'm one-handed now, so it's interesting. Things. So here we have a tool in the Azure command line that installs this, the virtual kubelet, installs the connector. Um, I guess I should, before I do this, I should, this is sort of like, the, there's no, there's nothing on my sleeves, I don't have sleeves, but there's nothing on my sleeves. The cube control. All right, so I have a very standard Kubernetes cluster running in, in the Azure Kubernetes service. Um, that uh, has three actual virtual machine nodes. Um, and if I run the connector, um, what it's actually going to do is it's going to go and install the virtual kubelet. It uses Helm to install the virtual kubelet onto uh, that cluster. Um, you can see that it, it's doing it right now. And the Helm is printed out. And now if I actually do kube control, Um, you'll see that the virtual kubelet is up and running, and now if I actually do kube control, um, you'll see that there's this new virtual kubelet node, Linux, here. Um, and now one of the things that we've done, actually, is we figure probably you want to know, you want to decide whether or not your containers should go onto the serverless infrastructure or not, because the cost profile is different, there's other sorts of things that you might want to care about, and so we actually taint this node um, and so if I actually do cubes, control, describe, oops. What you'll see right here is that we've put a taint on the node um, which says no schedule. So it means that unless your pods say that I tolerate this value, that I'm, I'm willing to be scheduled onto the virtual, the virtual serverless infrastructure, um, I don't want my containers to land there. So by default, the Kubernetes cluster just acts like a normal Kubernetes cluster. But if you have workloads that you're okay to burst into this serverless infrastructure, you can give that annotation. And in fact, if we do And we do, we look at this. Um, I have a deployment here. And right here, it's given the toleration of, of that taint. So it says, I'm OK to be scheduled onto this, into the serverless container infrastructure. Um, and if, in fact, then I say, OK, let me actually run that deployment. It's created the deployment. Um, and now if we do get pods, um, what you can see here, it's a little bit messy because the terminal is what, not wide enough, but what you can see here is that all four of those deployment containers have been scheduled onto the virtual kubelet and are going to be spun up in the uh, Azure Container Instances serverless container infrastructure. Right, so I hope this gives you a flavor for uh, effectively, you know, one of the places where I think we're going. I think that it is doubtless that all of you, or at least most of you, want to forget about machines. Um, and I really think that as we move forward with Kubernetes, we've done a great job defining this orchestration API and building tools on top of it. I think we need to also come along underneath and figure out how do we eliminate uh, the burdens of running machines and, and truly build out serverless Kubernetes clusters. Um, so that's it. Uh, might even be a little bit over time, but uh, I want to open it up for questions if there are any. Thanks for listening. I'm five minutes over, so I'll take back two. Oh, all right, all right, cool. We'll just keep rolling. All right, yes. Um, so in this world, are you going to get charged for the virtual? Currently, it's based on resources you declare because, of course, if I allocate those resources for you, I can't. Unless I over provision, I can't allocate them for somebody else. You have to, yeah, you have to do a good job ahead of time estimating what usage you might you might use. I think you know over time, as you know, things like vertical auto scaling land in Kubernetes, we can start thinking about. 
providing you with the ability to adjust. So like you still have to tell us, but over time if we see that you asked for two gigs and really you only ever use one gig, we'll actually lower your, your restriction downward towards one gig and charge you less over time, right? Yeah. It, it's still a hard reservation, but but we'll adjust your reservation for you. I could imagine doing things like that. Maybe go to RAM would be more predictable for CPU. You just want to like, you want a sharp burst and then like... Yeah, the trouble is what if I put 10 of you on one machine and you all burst at the same time, right? I mean, so I mean, I could imagine also having like a lower tier like that. I mean, most clouds, Azure has burstable VMs. Other clouds have these kind of burstable VMs. So like I could imagine potentially building a lower, like a different tier. But that's a different tier of service than what we've built right now, where you're guaranteed that that's available to you. Okay. Yeah. Oh, sorry. The question was, um, do you pay for what you use, or do you pay for what you declare? And the answer is, you pay for what you declare. So, yeah. Right. Uh, you could. Currently, so I didn't mention it, but currently the container instances infrastructure that we have has a limitation in that it only gets public IPs. It can't get IP addresses inside of your cluster. That's coming soon. Um, but, and so that kind of limits your ability to actually make it work with the service load balancer. It, you can do it, but it, but it is probably not ideal um, for, for doing services right now. So again, this is sort of a you know, work in progress, I guess is what I would say. So yeah, far. Well, see, again, I, I think that I want to differentiate between serverless versus functions as a service. And so I think when you say open source serverless frameworks, I think generally that means open source functions as a service. And I think they're great, fantastic. It's a great developer experience, right? I don't think you're going to be able to build your, the entirety of your application in that developer experience. It's targeted to a very specific event-driven model of programming that I don't think can be extended to general purpose applications. Um, but fantastic, I love it. I mean, I, I kind of think have maybe, maybe someone tweeted that there's like 10 different implementations. Might be overkill, maybe, just saying. Like, maybe one. Um, but that's gonna happen, you know, and then I have confidence that that will happen eventually, so that's good. Which one do you think? Oh, I, I, first of all, I don't answer those questions, and second of all, I haven't played around with all 10, so, yeah. Um, I think the one that is most useful will win. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So I have both a glib question and a serious question. Which do you want? Oh, I like, uh, let's go glib. Okay, so why do you take a 1.5 gigabyte container to emulate a machine with a maximum memory of four, four megabytes? Oh, that's the default value. You can reduce it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, the serious question. Although actually it's an emulator, right? So I bet that that emulator needs a certain amount of memory just to like load itself in, right? Well, you uh, wrote it in Ruby, but. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, on the serious front, um, you touched on it in your open issues, but it seems like there's a certain amount of sort of semantic abstract mismatch around the first class idea of node in Kubernetes. Because virtual kubelet is presenting, I'm a node, but I'm essentially of unlimited size, and I'm really manufacturing nodes behind the scenes there. And um, it, it occurs to me that like a lot of the open issues resolve around the fact that conflated into Kubernetes idea of a node is a whole bunch of different concerns that your, the operator cares about, like failure domain, which you mentioned, but co-execution domain, affinity, anti-affinity, um, you know, license affinity, um, demon sets, you know, like one per node type of thing. And there's like a whole bunch of stuff that, if not broken, is at least distorted by the, the, the abstraction leakage that virtual Kerplet presents. And really the question is, where's the right place to start having discussions about this and how we either evolve Kubernetes abstractions or the sophistication of virtual Yeah, I mean, so this is happening in this. So the question is basically, the nodes will break down. Like the node abstraction is going to break down. It already is breaking down. It's breaking down by this. Um, and there's some things conflated around scheduling that are lined up with the node that may or may not be actually things you want with the node. Um, the discussion is happening in SIG node right now. Okay. Um, and you know, the, the, in the meeting, um, in the, the video meeting, and on the mailing list, and things like that. Um, you know, one of the one of the questions that people have been asking is, like, is modeling this thing as a node even the right thing? Should we introduce some other abstraction that is not a node that the Kubernetes knows about and knows how to schedule into? Um, uh, so that's you know, I think that's on the table. Um, uh, but I think it's important. I guess what I would say is, I think it's really important to have the discussion because I profoundly believe that this infrastructure is coming mm -hmm. 
and, and we've already built it, and it will get better, and other people will build it too. Um, and if we don't have the discussion, then the pressure of customers will lead to the development of another orchestrator on top of it. Mm -hmm. Will lead to the development of a serverless container native orchestrator. Um, and, and then there'll be another orchestrator war, and no one will be happy, and, you know, and I don't want that, right? So I think we have to have this discussion now, and, and figure it out while these things are nascent, um, and, and go from there. Um, I mean, I'd be content, like, if we, at the end of the day, we figure that, like, it's not gonna, that this is a really simple, this is more like a PaaS, and it's a simple use case, and we don't actually think there's a grow-up story, like, I'm okay with that, but I actually don't think that's true. I think there is going to be a grow-up story. I think that there is a desire for mixed mode here. Um, but we'll see. But it, it's important to have the discussion. So, so where, where do you come out on that discussion? Though? Like, what's your what's your impression as to whether? God, I don't know. It's so hard, right? Because I think that I love the node. I love the fact that the abstraction exists um, and that things know how to deal with it. But it's it is broken by this thing in a bunch of different ways. And I think it's just a question of like, can you tease apart the bits that it breaks? And separate them out enough that you can that the node can survive, or or do we need to do something else, Joe? Yes. All right. So uh, when you first presented this, Brian Grant immediately disagreed with you. Oh, so that means it must be I must be right. <laughs> <laughs> but there's there's I mean there's two ways to do it, and I think there's the virtual cubelet stuff that that you've been been working on, which is essentially an infinitely large node, right? right. And then there's there's the other way to do it, which is you create a cubelet on demand that's shrink wrapped to the size of the workload. Yeah. Right. And there's two different ways to represent that. Have you thought about sort of the pros and cons of both, or is it just like pick something and kind of make it? I think the trick there would be like, how do you get the scheduler to land on it? You'd have to write your own scheduler. I think. Yeah. Well, you may end up doing. And that. you may end up doing that anyway. And then if we do that, then then that makes sense. And I know like this is actually what Jenkins does, right? Like if you've looked at the Kubernetes Jenkins plugin, it basically creates a new slave. Every time, I'm not supposed to say that anymore. Um, what are they? I think they're still called slaves. Um, anyway, but it creates a new one and registers it with Jenkins every time you run a job, right? Like so, every build that you want to run, Jenkins has a notion of like a node, um, and it creates one just for that job and registers it. I have no idea how the scheduling works. I don't know how Jenkins decides. Like if it has multiple nodes, I don't know how Jenkins decides how to schedule. But they did, that's the model that they built for a very similar. Yeah. problem, basically. Um, and so I think either one could work, and it may be that that's easier. I'd rather not build a new scheduler. But 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 if it comes it's down to it, that's... Bash. Yeah, no, you can totally do it. It's more <laughs> about the like, complexity of adding it on, right? It's just like one more one more knob. Um, but that may very well be the best solution, is to write our own scheduler. So. Did, did I just hear you say that all scheduler plugins should eventually go upstream? Uh, I, said, I think I said they should only be written in Bash. Well, <laughs> um, PDF, PDF 11, so you're going to have to Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Um, no, I think it's good. I think it's good for all the schedulers to go upstream, for sure. I mean, I don't know. Like, maybe not. I mean, like, it's good to have schedulers on the outside, too. Like, I think it's good to have open source schedulers. I don't know that they necessarily all have to go up, like, into one project, effectively. Okay. So, I like what, like, the... Uh, the open grid, open sun grid folks have done with their schedule. Nabops. So, Nabops. Is that what it's called? They keep changing their name. Um, last time check. Last time check. All right. Anything else? Yeah, one more in the back. Uh, yeah, so if I'm trying to write a, a provider for virtual kubelet, like if you look at the existing implementations, some of them end up with a lot of no ops basically responding to the API server. Is there kind of like guidelines on like which operations do need to be defined? I mean, obviously it kind of like depends upon the platform, but. There's not like a really clear kind of set of like these three things have to work in order for the virtual public to kind of function properly. Yeah, we probably should do a better job of like saying like this this is what's needed for this piece of functionality, this is what's needed for this piece of functionality. And I think you need to be able to, I mean obviously run a container. Um, uh, I think that's and list containers. I think probably if you can run a container and list a container, you probably can implement at least something. But then it's like, well, is that okay? Like and should we have logs and so forth. So I, I guess we should probably document that better. That would be, would be the answer. So. All right, cool. Rhea, take that as an opinion. Yeah, yeah So Rhea is the, the PM who's running the whole thing. Um, and so if you have thoughts or questions, send, yeah. talk to her. She's the yeah. one who's running. We have a Slack channel on Kubernetes. Yeah. So and we're also starting a weekly meeting on virtual um, Kubernetes. For so hash virtual Kubernetes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, well, talk I'll, to us I'll there. Also, the documentation tomorrow. stuff, let's talk about what you want to do. Okay. All right, super cool. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.